Thank you very much uh, for that incredibly generous uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great privilege and an honor, actually rather humbling, uh, to stand here uh, to support, which is what I'm doing, this wonderful uh, organization. Uh, it's a very personal experience also, because as mentioned, um, the book that I wrote, which I'll talk about a little in a moment, East West Street, is a deeply personal book. You'll understand there are quite a few lawyers, I think, in the audience, that the one thing we are told never to do in our academic work or in our courtroom appearances is to talk about ourselves. Uh, and to talk about our families is probably an even greater no-no. And I needed to be coaxed by a wonderful editor. And so to stand here tonight and to speak uh, for World Jewish Relief is particularly significant because members of my family were supported by the predecessor of World Jewish Relief, uh, the central uh, British funds, which assisted various members of my family who arrived in 1938 and in 1939 from Vienna, the lucky ones who were able to get out, and were supported for a number of years. So I express my deep gratitude to Paul and to his incredible staff and to the trustees for the truly remarkable work that they do. I'm well aware of that work because my own work as an international lawyer and as an academic uh, and a practitioner in courts takes me to a lot of the 19 countries that this wonderful organization works in. Uh, and I thank each and every person who's here tonight who is providing by their presence incredible support for an extraordinary organization that provides necessary help to people, Jewish people, but also non-Jewish people in some parts of the world, particularly in the refugee community, at a time in which we face tremendous difficulties. So I have a personal connection with this organization and a personal connection with this gathering tonight. I'm deeply aware of the past in my professional work and in the present in my professional work. I have seen more mass graves than I would wish to see. I have become acutely aware of the capacity of human beings to do terrible things to each other and to leave many people in states of utter and almost perpetual distress. And so in a sense, uh, I, I feel humbled by the fact that the book uh, that I've written recently, a very personal book, East West Street, is in a sense constructed on the ashes cast upon the misfortune of others, my family, probably many of your families, uh, and I feel therefore an acute sense of responsibility in terms of responding to wonderful invitations such as these. As many of you who have read the book will know, having regard to the theme of tonight's dinner, every life saved is a remarkable achievement. I owe a particular debt of gratitude to the remarkable individual who saved my mother's life, my mother having been born in Vienna three months after the Anschluss, which is about to mark its 80th anniversary in a couple of months' time, and who was left in Vienna as a one-year-old child when her father went off to Paris under very difficult circumstances to try to save the family. And we never knew in the family who it was that had saved my mother's life and brought her from Vienna to Paris. I'm not going to spoil it for those of you who haven't yet read the book, but I started with a tiny scrap of paper on which were written the words, Miss E. M. Tilney, Bluebell Road, Manuka, Norwich, Angleterre. Now the lucky thing is that I'm a barrister. There's not much that's positive to be said, I think, generally about all aspects of being a barrister, but one thing we do know how to do is to find information. And armed with just that scrap of paper, I was able to identify the truly exceptional lady who came from Norwich who turned out 
to be an evangelical Christian missionary who made it her duty to save people threatened from the Nazi scourge because of her particular interpretation of Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verse 1. You'll find a lot more in the book about it. But I pay homage to that remarkable individual who spent years saving individuals at great risk to herself. And I'm deeply happy to let you know that one of the products of East West Street was that Miss Tilney has now been named as a righteous person at Yad Vashem, something I feel very privileged also to be associated with. The book began accidentally, as the best things in life do. I was carrying on my work as a barrister and as a teacher. Out of the blue, I receive an invitation to deliver a lecture at a very obscure university in a very obscure town in a part of the world, the Ukraine, that I didn't know much about. Would I come and give a lecture about the work that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide? Absolutely, I said. I'd be delighted to do that. Not as it happens because I had a burning desire to give another lecture about crimes against humanity and genocide, but because the invitation came from the city of Lviv, also known as Lemberg, also known as Lvuf. And I suspect there are many people in this room who have connections with that part of the world. And the reason that I accepted the invitation was that my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, was born in Lemberg in 1904. And I thought to accept the invitation and to go to Lviv, as it's now called, in a few months' time, would enable me to begin to understand who I was and where I came from. I just wanted to find my grandfather's house. And so I accepted the invitation, and dutifully I spent part of the summer researching the lecture that I would give. And I was astonished to make two discoveries. The first was that the man who invented the concept of crimes against humanity, actually on July the 29th, 1945, in a garden of a house in Cambridge here in England, Hirsch Lauterpacht, the greatest international lawyer of the 20th century, came from Lviv. And actually, he had studied at the university that had invited me, and the folks who had invited me were completely unaware of that fact. How amazing, I thought, that I'm going to go off to Lviv and find the origins of crimes against humanity. And then I discovered a second extraordinary coincidence, that the man who invented the concept of genocide, another great jurist, Raphael Lemkin, came from Lviv and studied at the very same university and the people who had invited me were unaware of that fact. You literally, as Anthony Beaver generously said, could not invent it, that the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide could be traced to a single city, a single university, indeed a single teacher, and a single classroom. And I spent seven years alongside my day job researching what eventually became a totally unexpected book. Of course, into the story eventually emerged a third man, because originally I was just going to write about my granddad, Leon, about Lauterpacht, whose son was my first teacher of international law at Cambridge, and Raphael Lemkin. But a fourth man interceded into the story, Hans Frank, not just anybody, a lawyer, actually Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to 1933, who arrived in Lviv, or Lemberg as it was renamed once it became part of the government general, and worked his appalling magic on the 1st of August 1942, when he arrived in the city to announce the extermination of the entire Jewish population of the city 
and of the surrounding areas. And in that way, Frank became the fourth man in the story and the connector between the three other men. You take the story forward and you discover that Lauterpacht and Lemkin are prosecutors at Nuremberg. Lauterpacht with the British, Lemkin with the Americans. And lo and behold, who do they prosecute? They prosecute Hans Frank. But they don't know when the day the trial starts, on the 20th of November 1945, that the man they are prosecuting is responsible for the killings of their entire families. As a barrister who appears in court, that has, I have to say, a very chilling consequence. So it looks like it would be a sort of really dark and terrible story. And in a certain way, it is. But as the review in the New York Times book review put it in its headline, written by Bernard-Henri Lévy, the article, the French philosopher, out of the darkness came light. And that, in a sense, is reflective of the work of this extraordinary organization. And I've been astonished by what has transpired. It simply never occurred to me in writing the book that it would obtain the currency that it has in terms of the number of copies that have been read, the number of languages it has been translated into, which now is about to exceed 20. Uh, this no writer and certainly no lawyer could ever dream of happening. But it is the myriad of wonderful stories that have emerged out of this book that really have inspired my sense of a positive disposition that good things can come out of even the most terrible of things. And let me just share one story. I had the great fortune, uh, amongst many great fortunes, of having a friend who I was at university with who became the director of the BBC Proms. And every spring he writes and says, Philippe, why don't you come with your wife? Choose a concert. Come and, come and see a prom. Come and sit with me at the BBC seats. Thank you, I say, I'd love to come. He sends me the program. I go through the program and I settle on a prom that was given last September by the extraordinary and world-renowned pianist Emmanuel Axe. Why do I choose Emmanuel Axe? Because Emmanuel Axe was born in Lviv in 1949. And I was just sort of curious. I had quite a few of his records. I knew his piano playing. I liked his piano playing. I'd never seen him perform. So we went. And we had a fantastic evening. Six and a half thousand people thrilled at the Royal Albert Hall. At the end of the concert, my friend David said, would you like to meet Mr. Axe? I said, I'd love to. Do you think, is, is that possible? Could I, would he be, I mean, he's tired, he's performed. Why would he want to see us? He said, no, no, he's a lovely person. Let's see if uh, we can get together with him. So we went down deep into the bowels of the Royal Albert Hall. And I was introduced uh, with my wife to Emmanuel Axe. He was there with a friend, uh, a Greek um, classical music impresario whose name I remember only as Kostas. My friend David introduced me to uh, Emmanuel Axe and his friend Kostas, Philippe Sands, Emmanuel Axe. Kostas says to me, Philippe Sands, Philippe Sands, you wrote that book. I know that book, it's about Lviv. I said, yeah, that's me. He says, Manny, Manny, I just gave you the book yesterday. Have you read it? It's 500 pages. So Emmanuel says, no, I, I haven't read it, but how wonderful, as you know, I'm from Lviv. How long were you there for? He says, I was born there in 49. My father survived in hiding. I left when I was seven after I had my first piano lesson. Have you been back? No. Do you want to go back? I'd love to go back. Have you got any trips 
Emmanuel Axe lives in New York. Have you got any trips to Europe later on this year? I'd be honored and thrilled to arrange a return visit for you. I'm sure the folks in Lviv would be thrilled for you to come back. He says, let me get my diary. He goes and gets his diary. He says, I've got a concert in Stockholm on the 9th of November and another one in Zurich on the 13th. I could do it on the 10th and the 11th of November. I say bingo, because that is the weekend we've been invited to Lviv by the mayor of the city to do a performance that's related to East West Street and to unveil plaques to honor Lauterpacht and Lemkin and their families. Just just happened last November. A week later, Emmanuel Axe has bought his plane tickets, and two months later, I find myself on a stage performing with Emmanuel Axe. Out of this whole episode emerges a 95-year-old gentleman from Lviv, one of the last remaining Jews of the city who was there before the war. A truly extraordinary man. Boris Dorfman, aged 95, living with his wonderful wife, actually pretty impecunious, but pretty happy. And we get to meet Boris Dorfman. And the moment that I saw Maniacs with Boris Dorfman is a moment I will never forget. They introduce each other, and Boris says to Manny, I knew your father. I knew the apartment you grew up in. Let's go and see it. There are, in these faraway places, remnants of a remarkable community, communities that existed in these parts of the world. And World Jewish Relief is an organization like no other. Boris Dorfman is fortunate enough not to need the assistance of World Jewish Relief. But on his account, to us, many of his remaining friends are desperately, desperately in need of support and assistance. And you are the people to offer that support and assistance. And so I end on a story that I hope you will see as essentially having an element of positiveness and happiness at its heart. That moment in life where you're privileged to witness a coming together of two human beings who can connect back and talk to a moment from the 1930s, thought to be long forgotten, and one of those participants can share something with another, can transmit information across and say, I knew the apartment you were built, born in. I remember the lampshade in that apartment. And the other participant can say, and you are not alone in this faraway place. That is the kind of moment I think that World Jewish Relief stands for. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to speak here tonight. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be with each and every one of you. Thank you very much indeed.